The program you are about to hear is an interview with Mr. Robert Welch, founder and president of the John Birch Society. The material in this program is from a series of interviews given by Mr. Welch to members of the Fourth Estate during the recent past. This material was collected and brought into a single interview form in June of 1971. It first appeared in print in the July 1971 issue of the John Birch Society Monthly Bulletin. It is our hope in bringing this material to you that you will pass it along to your friends, thereby making them more aware of the master conspiracy that exists in our world. And if enough people are prompted by listening to this program to go on and learn more of the truth about our nation's enemies, it will help a little bit towards enabling us to celebrate many more Independence Days in the future. The interview commences with a question directed to Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, do you expect to win this struggle? Yes. More precisely, we intend to play a vital part among the combined forces that in time will fully expose and completely destroy the whole conspiracy. You mean the communist conspiracy, of course. No, we mean far more than that. We believe, just as Dr. Bella Dodd had come to believe before she died, and as many others do today, that the communist movement is merely one arm of an immense and tremendously powerful master conspiracy. What is the other arm? Oh, this gigantic octopus has many arms, which now writhe and twist all over the world. One arm is ideological socialism with such tentacles as the Fabian Society in England and the Americans for Democratic Action in the United States. Another arm is organized international diplomatic and political intrigue. Among its best-known tentacles are the Cecil Rhodes Roundtable Groups, including the Council on Foreign Relations in this country. There are a dozen more arms of varying size, purpose, and importance. And all of these arms are controlled by one brain? Probably. Their activities are directed from one nerve center anyway. Otherwise, these thousands of tentacles would sometimes foul each other up by moving at cross purposes. They almost never do, even when they cunningly create that impression. Quite frequently, for instance, some tentacle of the communist arm is engaged in ostentatiously vicious rioting against the policies of the political arm. But a careful scrutiny of the whole maneuver is usually quite revealing. The rioting and clamor supply the political arm with the excuse and the means to seize more power for itself and to make further concessions to the demands of the communist arm, which is exactly what the master conspiracy had planned in the first place. But if there is one nerve center plotting all of these worldwide activities, where is it located? We don't know. It is doubtful that any anti-communist knows, and it is certain that, except for a very tiny fraction at the top, the tens of millions of communists and other agents of the conspiracy throughout the world do not know either. And there are that many communists? Well, about 5% of the population of the USSR comes to 10 million, plus about 3% of the population of the satellite countries, plus probably 1% to 2% of the population of mainland China, plus from 1% to 3% of most other countries. Reasonably dependable estimates add up to at least 50 million communists among the total population of the Earth. But Moscow is not the headquarters of the international master conspiracy? Heavens no. The Kremlin is theoretically in charge of the communist arm. But let us emphasize once more how subordinate this arm is to the total design. The master conspiracy had been in existence for two generations and was already powerful and extensive enough to bring on the simultaneous revolutions of 1848 in many countries before the communist movement was even inaugurated. 
So Karl Marx did not originate the conspiracy. Far from it. Marx did not even originate its communist arm. In 1847, he was a young revolutionary intellectual who was hired by one group of the conspirators to codify the plans, methods, and purposes of their activities. This he did with such ruthless logic, although with almost no originality, that his party platform for the conspiracy, known as the Communist Manifesto, gave birth to the communist movement, and incidentally brought the word communism into the European languages with its present meaning. But Karl Marx himself was considered so unimportant as merely a midwife at this birth that his name did not even appear on the manifesto when it was first published in 1848, nor for 20 years thereafter. The glorification of Marx as a great sociological scientist and philosopher was an afterthought to which the conspiracy began to give effect decades after the Communist Manifesto first appeared. And this subordination of the communist movement to the service of the master conspiracy has continued ever since? Most assuredly. Do not forget that when Lenin and Trotsky took over the Russian Revolution from Kerensky in 1917, they were financed and otherwise aided by their conspiratorial bosses in Germany and the United States, even though these two countries were at war with each other at the time. The conspirators, however, as always, were only at war with civilization. They were operating in unison for their own purposes on both sides of all lesser conflicts, as their predecessors had learned to do during the Napoleonic Wars a hundred years before. Lenin was only a brilliant agent, and communism a growing agency of the insiders at the top of the conspiracy when they established Russia as a physical base for the use of this communist arm. But if there is an inner circle at the summit which can select, support, and control its agents at all levels, why does it permit such rivalry as that which occurred between Trotsky and Stalin? For the soundest reason in the world, from the point of view of the conspiracy, this policy permits and enables the most cunning most cold-blooded and most power-hungry members or agents of that conspiracy to rise into its highest echelons and thus to add their strength and abilities to the top command. This is why, as we pointed out in the Blue Book a dozen years ago, there is found in the upper levels of the conspiracy the most ruthless competition that exists anywhere in the animal kingdom. Well, where did Stalin stand in this picture? He benefited enormously from the leeway for competition, of course, and so did the conspiracy from his driving ambition. For it is doubtful that Trotsky could even have kept the communists in control of Russia during those early years. By cunning, bluff, and terror, Stalin did so. And he was then able, in 1933, to prevent the utter financial collapse of the Soviet regime, as well as to accomplish many other most important objectives by obtaining the official recognition of his government by the United States. But did uh, Stalin remain merely a subordinate agent of some inner circle above him? Not in the long run, at least not in our opinion. There have been many aspirants for raw power who have come up through the communist ranks to find themselves eventually within, within higher and higher and hence smaller and smaller concentric circles of the conspiratorial hierarchy. In the United States, Walter Ruther and Alger Hiss, before his exposure, did fairly well in that direction. Among dozens who could be named in other countries are Mao Chi Tung, Fidel Castro, Willie Brandt, and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. But Stalin is the outstanding example of success on that route. Can you define the route? Yes. First, 
By purges and assassinations, Stalin made himself the supreme commander of the communist arm of the conspiracy. Second, by unremitting guile, cruelty, and drive, he made that arm so powerful and so immensely useful to the master conspiracy that in time the arm became synonymous with the whole body, for most people, everywhere. And even we ourselves, for the sake of simplicity, when there is no real need for more precise language, may speak of what the communists are doing when we really mean the communists and the whole conspiratorial organization above them and around them. So Stalin climbed very near to the top. We think so, yes. And that his voice had become a very powerful one within the highest echelon before the end of his career. Yet it should still be noted that his death in 1953 caused no slightest change in the program or pause in the advance whereby the conspiracy was moving towards its goal. In reality, what is that goal? There is one question, anyway, to which the answer is sure and simple. It is to rule the world. For six generations, this self-perpetuating and ever-expanding clique of conspirators has been making steady progress towards the destruction of all religion, of all existing governments, and of all traditional human institutions. This was in order that they should be able to establish the new order of their civilization under their absolute and tyrannical rule on the ruins of the old one. Who originated any such nightmarish dream as that? Surprisingly enough, during the last half of the 18th century, it was quite commonplace, especially in France and Germany. All the tremendous intellectual ferment of the period, as sparked by Rousseau, Voltaire, King Frederick II of Prussia, the French Encyclopédistes, and many others, was busily brewing revolutionary concepts of this variety. But it was a man named Adam Weishaupt who, on May 1, 1776, organized a secret society called the Order of the Illuminati, which apparently, through merges with or absorption of other similarly-minded revolutionary groups, became the central and solid core of the lasting and growing conspiracy. And Weishaupt laid down for his followers in specific language the very plan which we outlined for you just a minute ago. And you think that plan is still afoot today? Most assuredly so, and without any basic change. In fact, since 1848, some communist leaders have, on several occasions, openly proclaimed this program. Such bragging was intended to give confidence and direction to the growing number of conspiratorial workers, but not to be taken seriously by the world at large. Is uh, Quigley's book in that category? We suspected that you knew more about the subjects of this conversation than you were pretending. Well, only when you get into the field of uh, current journalism instead of ancient history. But uh, what about Professor Carol Quigley? We believe his book is intended to spread defeatism among the anti-communists, which is a new wrinkle in the script. As you probably know, Quigley's recent enormous volume, Tragedy and Hope, has boastfully informed all who would listen that the conspiracy is now so near to final and complete success as to make resistance a foolhardy tragedy and peaceful submission the only hope. And since the conspiracy has already imposed its incredibly brutal tyranny on one-third of the populations of the earth, Quigley's blackmailing threat is not to be lightly brushed aside. But why, during almost two centuries, would able and practical men, even those with a power-hungry psychosis, devote their lives to so evil a cause from which only some later clique would benefit? Oh, but they never did. <clears throat> this would have been contrary to the whole knowledge of human psychology 
on which the conspiracy has always counted so heavily in its plans. Everything about the grandiose scheme was designed to provide its adherents with appropriate rewards in money, prestige, or power during their own lives. It's too bad we can't take the time to give you a hundred illustrations with convincing details. Well, never mind the hundred. Name three, as the saying goes, served up with or without the details. Okay. There's Woodrow Wilson, who became president of the United States. Nathan Tiercy, who became president of Harvard. And Christian Herter, who became governor of Massachusetts and then secretary of state. In every case, these men were enabled by the insiders to achieve such positions of power and glory because of what they had already done to support the conspiratorial program as assurance of the far more important things they would later do, and actually did, in higher places. The record to that effect is clear beyond all question, and it seems very unlikely that any one of them would ever have climbed half so high without the invisible but immensely powerful help up the ladder. This whole process is of the very essence of the plot. But you cannot even guess where the headquarters of this master conspiracy are located. Oh, yes. When you asked that question before, you were looking for something we could prove. If you would let us give you a guess, we can make it a good one. We'll even creep up on it with some solid history. From the founding of the Illuminati on May 1, 1776, to about 1786, its base was in Bavaria. Excuse me a minute. You mentioned the birthday again. Is that why May 1 is now the International Red Holiday? Yes. Okay. So where and why were the headquarters moved in about 1786? to Paris, <clears throat> probably not by deliberate intention, but by the natural development of events. For in the 1780s, Weishaupt's associates succeeded in illuminating, as they described it, and taking charge of most of European Freemasonry outside of England. With the Grand Orient Lodge of Paris, which had long been a hotbed of revolutionary and subversive activity as headquarters. The reach of this illuminated movement was rapidly extended throughout more than 300 lodges in France and most of those in the German states. Then this organization helped mightily to bring on the French Revolution. Its hardcore survived through and profited steadily from both the revolution proper and the Napoleonic Wars which devastated Europe for 20 years thereafter. Thus the Illuminati became established in Paris as a base for the worldwide revolution they were already planning. But where are the headquarters now? Believe it or not, we are creeping up, however laboriously, on that surmise. Despite the extreme secrecy surrounding the master conspiracy during the 19th century, there is considerable evidence to indicate that those headquarters remained in Paris and possibly for a while in Brussels, during most of those hundred years, that the center of power then shifted to London, that during the 1930s, a similar gradual shift of the nerve center occurred, this time to the United States. And it is our guess that since at least 1945, both the formal and de facto headquarters of this vast evil clique have been like Poe's purloined letter, hidden by their very obviousness somewhere in New York City. Why? For many reasons. First, you must realize that money, war, and hatred are the three major tools which these conspirators constantly forge for their use, and we do mean forge, as instrumentalities for advancing both their power and their destructive program. So it seems logical that their central command would go where the big money is, where the most can be accomplished in fomenting foreign wars, and where a huge melting pot provides the greatest potential for stirring up bitterness between various racial groups, religious groups, and economic levels. From New York City, 
waves of bitterness can be set in motion that will not only manifest themselves all over the United States, but amid the cedars of Lebanon, in the college halls of Latin America, and around the floating market of Bangkok. Well, you don't have to get political about it. Uh, what other reasons are there? A very sad and prosaic one of extreme importance. It is simply that for at least 30 years, the most powerful single force in advancing communist aims all over the world has been the United States government. And Washington, like Moscow, is now run from New York City. So the top command naturally settles itself at the source of power. Do you really mean that? Quite literally. Examine the actual history as objectively as you can and see if you can name one nation out of the 40 or more whose people are now enslaved that was not delivered into the hands of the communists by the machinations or the immense help of our government. From Poland and Yugoslavia to Cuba and Katanga to North Vietnam and China, the details of our betrayal of these victims have varied, but the basic story has been everywhere the same. Also, it is perfectly obvious to anybody who has the courage to study the facts objectively that World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War have all been fought by our government for the benefit of the communists. The tragic truth is that since at least 1937, the working control over our government by the insiders of the master conspiracy has steadily increased, and they have used that control with masterful cunning, deception, and ruthlessness from New York as a base. This gets a bit thick for me. Uh, how do they get away with it? By brilliant pretenses that are the exact opposite of the truth, by brainwashing propaganda of colossal proportions, and by following tested formulas that have now been rehearsed for generations. The whole world is truly a stage today, and almost everything happening on that stage is an act for which the basic script has been written in advance. The most important characters are allowed and expected to do considerable improvising, but always in tune with the roles they have assumed and the plot to which they are bound. And the impresarios in New York select the leading actors for this colossal show and change the cast at will? The easiest way to answer that question is by repeating a rumor that was fairly widespread in some circles three or four years ago. It was that David Rockefeller, president of one of the world's largest banks, had fired Nikita Khrushchev as the Prime Minister of Soviet Russia by simply sending a messenger to Moscow to tell Khrushchev that it was time to step down. We have no idea whether there was any truth to it or not, but we can assure you that this rumor was entirely in line with the way the world is actually being run today, and that there probably is some banker in New York City who is high enough up in the conspiracy to be able to issue such orders and have them obeyed without question. Uh, what about a cup of coffee? There's a sprawl. Our friend here is so flabbergasted by just an inkling of the truth that he needs a cup of coffee to revive him. Can you cope? Okay, thanks for the coffee. Let's go on. How much of what you have been telling me can be proved? Every word of it, beyond all question, except where we have fairly indicated that we were dealing in surmises. And for many years, even our surmises have had a sad and unfortunate habit of turning out to be true. Well, then why aren't these facts better known? Because of such enormous efforts to suppress them, especially since around 1800, the most arduous task of the conspiracy 
has been to keep the world believing that there was no conspiracy and to smother all books and pamphlets which would reveal its existence. Because so many events and developments could be shown by any honest historian to have been plotted in advance by the insiders, this clique even invented a phrase, the conspiratorial theory of history, as one means of ridiculing into ignominious silence all of those who tried to proclaim any substantial part of the truth about what was taking place. And in their own language, they have done their utmost by every conceivable means to impose on those who would expose the conspiracy all the torments of hell. This accounts for what has happened right here in our own country to Attorney General Harry Doherty in the 1920s, to Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s, and to the John Birch Society during the last dozen years. All right, I didn't do it. So now tell me, just who and what are these insiders that you keep talking about? They are men in the higher echelons of the master conspiracy. It is the insiders at the very top who control the whole apparatus. But they are not communists. Oh, some of them are. Most of them are not and never have been. Again, can you name three? Yes, or 300. Among those we have mentioned many times before, as probably insiders in this sense, are Nelson Rockefeller, Henry Cabot Lodge, and Cyrus Eden. We doubt if any of these men has ever even seen a communist cell. But we do not have to convince you that they have worked steadily for the communist cause during all of their public careers. But if a man does not come up through the Communist Party, how is he ever brought into the conspiracy in the first place? As a rule, he is pulled into the fringes of the conspiratorial organization during his college years because his family is rich or famous or important. This is exactly in accordance with instructions laid down by Weishaupt for the Illuminati nearly 200 years ago and followed ever since. Such a recruit is trained and tested and then sent back into his family circle for the sake of the assets and influence that he can gradually bring to the service of the conspiracy. But why are they not soon recognized for what they are? Partly because most of them move to the left by subtle and gradual stages, but mainly because the fundamentally decent human mind simply refuses to believe that men in such high places can be so incredibly evil. This is why most of the top conspirators in any country belong to the very top social, economic, educational, or political circles of that country. It is also why a social revolution and even communism is always imposed on any people from the top down why the poor suckers who are seduced into creating pressure from the bottom by their riots and barricades have no slightest idea of the horror that they are preparing for themselves and why the condition of the masses is always worse in any country the communists have taken over than it was before. The insiders are interested in nothing but power and more power and more absolute power for themselves. The insiders that you mentioned were all contemporaries. Can you name some out of earlier periods? Scores, if you want them. Moving backward from the present, our sampling could include Christian Herder, John Foster Dulles, Theorello H. LaGuardia, Bernard Baruch, Carter Glass, Thomas W. Lamont, Newton D. Baker, John Dewey, Andrew Carnegie, and the most important American insider of the first decades of this century, Edward Mendel House. If you wanted us to go further back, we would include the names of Albert Pike, Judah P. Benjamin, Thaddeus Stevens, and Edwin M. Stanton. What about in other countries? Well, to compile any sizable list, we should need more time in order to make sure of our ground. But we could start 
with the former Prime Minister of England, Harold, Harold Wilson, and with David Lloyd George long before him, and of course with Cecil Rhodes. On the continent, we could certainly begin with Prince Bernhardt of the Netherlands, or with Georges Pompidou, the present Prime Minister of France, and come up with many unquestionable names as we moved back to Prince Otto von Bismarck of Germany, and, rather surprisingly, a man Bismarck destroyed, the Emperor Napoleon III of France. You mean that Louis Napoleon was a member of the conspiracy? Oh, beyond all question. That's how he came to be able to take such advantage of the revolution of 1848 as to make himself Emperor of France within four years thereafter. Even during his forced exile in the United States around 1830, he was known by the nickname Carbonaro. This was because he had long been a member of that revolutionary combination of a secret society and a guerrilla army founded in Italy, which was known as the Carbonari. And it is worth mentioning parenthetically, while we are on the subject, that John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln, was also a member of the Carbonari. But to follow up the extreme significance of that fact would take us right out of the present ballpark. I'm sure it would. So let's return to Napoleon III. If he was one of the insiders, why did they let him be completely ruined? Because as emperor, he gradually acquired delusions of grandeur with resulting traits and ambitions which were putting him on the side of the traditions and system of governments that the insiders were trying to break to pieces. Actually, it was for exactly the same reason that their predecessors had turned against the original Napoleon in 1810, after he had married Marie Louise of Austria, for he thus allied himself with the very ancien regime which the Illuminati insiders of that period had been seeking to demolish, and which Napoleon himself up until then, as the child and chief beneficiary of the revolution, had been so mightily helping them to do. They certainly did not want so able a protagonist as Napoleon to wind up on the other side helping to preserve the old order. And within five years, they were able to see him exiled permanently to St. Helena. But this discussion also leads too far afield. I agree. Let's come back closer to the present for one more sally into history before we return home altogether. Why did you omit Ramsay MacDonald of England? and Charles de Gaulle of France in your short list of insiders just now. For a very good reason. We were concentrating on important members of the conspiracy who had not come to glory out of the communist ranks. It is too hard to tell about Ramsay MacDonald for us to venture a guess here. There are strong indications that he was a communist. The fact that he opposed World War I, however, does raise questions. For that most senseless of all wars in history, with no possible reason for those on either side to be fighting each other, was certainly contrived and brought on deliberately by the propaganda intrigues and machinations of the insiders. It was designed by them to be, as it certainly became, the most massive long-range destroyer of all the traditions and character and institutions and principles of the old order of civilization that they had been able to achieve since the original French Revolution. Now hold it a minute. Skip Ramsay MacDonald. What about Charles de Gaulle? Do you mean that he was an actual communist? He almost certainly had been in his earlier years. He was one of Leon Blum's men when that communist became Prime Minister of France in 1936, Blum even had the audacity to fly the hammer and sickle flag from the masthead of French naval vessels. And incidentally, the fact should be of some interest to Americans that it was de Gaulle's patron, Leon Blum, who introduced into management labor problems the communist technique of the sit-down strike which Walter Ruther then used so ruthlessly in this country against General Motors. But you must have more evidence than that on which to base your belief that de Gaulle was a communist. Yes, a great deal more. 
and some of it is worth repeating here as an object lesson for all Americans who will read whatever you may write. Let's begin with the fact that after 1940, de Gaulle used typically vicious and ruthless communist tactics in eliminating by murder, false accusations, and other means all high officers in the French army, such as Admiral Darlan and General Giraud, who stood in his way. He went on by the same methods to the virtual destruction of that army and the substitution in its place of his own resistance group, to the skillful undermining of Marshal Pétain's government and to the brilliantly cunning steps in his climb to completely illegal dictatorship over France in 1944. Then he allowed the communist hoodlums of his resistance to engage in their so-called purification of France, whereby over a hundred thousand patriotic Frenchmen were murdered and more than a million incarcerated during the next 15 months. Even theoretically, this was for nothing more than having obeyed the orders of their legitimate government under Pétain. Actually, it was a typical use of communist terror to suppress all opposition. Yes, uh, I am familiar with what Cicely Huddleston wrote in his excellent book, France, the Tragic Years. And I gather that you feel de Gaulle was personally cognizant of and responsible for everything that happened in this massive reign of terror. There can be no doubt about it. At this very time, de Gaulle had deliberately called back from Moscow the wartime deserter and traitor, Maurice Thorez, head of the Communist Party of France, as second in command to de Gaulle himself in ruling the country. And while we cannot name them offhand, there were four other known high-level communists installed in his official council. It's no wonder that the daily worker in this country gloated so gushingly over what de Gaulle was doing to France, or that even respectable American newspapers were then referring to de Gaulle as Stalin's man. But by the beginning of 1946, I remember, uh, de Gaulle was obliged to retire into his role as an elder statesman. Why? For many reasons. First, there was the returning sanity of the French people and their rising resentment against the terror. Second, the high command of the master conspiracy obviously felt that any effort to make France a Soviet satellite or an outright communist nation at that time would be premature. They had many other fish to fry before that step would be logical. Stalin and his friend Eisenhower with the full power of the American occupation forces under Eisenhower's command to pave the way, were already extremely busy in the far more logical step of bringing Poland, East Germany, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and other countries of Eastern and Central Europe under Stalin's rule. De Gaulle and his designs to Sovietize France were to be saved for another day. Which came a dozen years later. Yes, certainly proving that the greatest asset the conspiracy has in any country is the poor memory of its people and the congenital gullibility of the human race. For de Gaulle came back to power in 1958, you will recall, posing as an anti-communist with the avowed mission of keeping Algeria French. His actual purpose, of course, has became obvious in time, was to betray Algeria and its pitiful people, who were loyal French citizens, into communist hands. And somewhat incidentally, in doing so, to make a shambles once again out of the French army through the resistance of both its officers and men to the treason that was being imposed upon them. De Gaulle has the distinction of being the only man in history whoever deliberately destroyed the army of his own country twice in one lifetime. You spoke of lessons to be learned by Americans from de Gaulle's career, such as? There are many. Some we've already touched on. 
most important perhaps, is one standard technique used over and over by the insiders. Whenever a rising awareness and resentment of what the communists are doing begins to reach the danger point in any country at any time, the communist conspiracy always has one of its own men built up by deception and propaganda, all ready to move around in front and lead the crusade against itself. Thus all the steam of the opposition can either be dissipated in futility or even gradually maneuvered into support of communist purposes as by Eisenhower following 1952 and de Gaulle following 1958. And you can be sure that the same plan is now afoot for future communist needs here in the United States. All right, let's unharness de Gaulle and hitch this conversation onto Eisenhower. Was he a communist? Not in our opinion. He was exactly what we said he was in The Politician, namely, a conscious, dedicated agent of the communist conspiracy, or what we would today call an insider. In order to advance the march of communism towards world rule, he committed many acts of treason against his country and many heinous crimes against humanity. The most cruel and most massive of these crimes, known as Operation Kielhall, consisted of the forced repatriation into Stalin's hands in 1945 and 1946 of more than two million refugees from communism including not only civilian women and children who had lived outside of Russia since 1939, but tens of thousands of men who had fought bravely with us as our allies against the Germans. And Eisenhower already had Operation Kielhall underway entirely on his own initiative long before he had received any such orders from Washington or the Dean Agreement had been signed at Yalta. Where have the details of Operation Keelhaul been exposed or recorded? In part, at least, in many places, despite all of the powerful communist efforts to the contrary. The English author, Peter Huxley Blythe, gives a great many of the tragic facts in his excellent book, The East Came West. But if you will pardon us for telling the truth, by far the most complete and best documented account of the whole horror is to be found in our own book, The Politician. You are visibly making a plug for The Politician in the hope that I will use it. I recognize this volume of history has been mercilessly smothered and that it has stood up very well as to accuracy and documentation against massive efforts to discredit it. But why are you so anxious to have the book more widely read? Because it is a solidly factual record of Eisenhower's immense contribution to the advance of communism, both as a general, as a college president, and then as president of the United States. Nobody can understand what the Nixon administration is doing without first knowing what the Eisenhower administration did. And properly appraising the present administration is of extreme importance. So just what is the Nixon administration doing? Up until recently, it has been making all the proper motions and statements in supposedly standing up for balanced budgets and against inflation, for a continued dependence on a free enterprise economy against our rapid slide into complete socialism, and for American patriotism against an ignominious surrender to our communist enemies. But even while proclaiming these once Republican and always American positions, the administration has been going smilingly down to defeat on every issue. And there has been no change? Yes, for the worse. Now the president is openly stating that he's a Keynesian in economics, that he wants to get us out of the war in Vietnam without even any pretense or possibility of victory as rapidly as he can, and that he wants even the Red Chinese, as well as the Soviet regimes of Europe, to climb into bed with us. The big bed, or the great merger, that he has in mind is obviously the communist-controlled United Nations. 
and he is now not only acting directly in violation of the campaign promises on which he was elected, but is daily declaring his open repudiation of those promises. Well, I must say that in so brief and informal a survey, you have given me quite a scary picture of the size and power of the long experience and entrenched positions of the tremendous progress and deadly purpose of the master conspiracy as you see it. Aren't you frightened by the outlook? Frightened, yes. For if the United States is taken over by the communists, there is no question but that the remainder of the free world will be subjugated in a few months. And there will follow the greatest bloodbath in human history to wipe out even all potential resistance to the communist tyranny. But pessimistic, not at all. For the insiders still have a long way to go before they can impose their slavery on the American people. And there is a great deal that can be done to prevent it. But you think that we already have a communist-controlled government. Oh, without question. There are only about 15 governments now left in the whole world that are not, for all practical purposes, run by the communists. But that does not make us a communist country by any means. Charles de Gaulle told his closest associates in 1962 that he would make France a communist nation within five years. The statement probably was not backed up by any plans of his bosses within the inmost circle of the conspiracy. More likely, it was just a typical boast by one of the most egotistic and vicious traitors and criminals who ever lived. But the results still show how wrong some of these vaunted expectations of the de Gaulle's and the Khrushchev's and of their counterparts in this country can be. And there have been many other examples. You lost me at one point back there. What is it that determines whether a nation should be classified as communist? There is one sure criterion. It is whether or not the people can leave that country at will. Every communist nation is simply a gigantic prison from which nobody is allowed to escape. This is shown by the tens of thousands who lose their lives every year trying to swim across the five miles from Red China to Hong Kong, or to get across the Berlin Wall, or to find their way through other holes in the iron and bamboo curtains. And the real point is that the people of the United States are still a long way indeed from having the prison walls of that kind closed around them. What about free movement within a country? That's another test as is the free use of one's own property or money. United States citizens can still take any or all of their money out with them, whether on a temporary trip or if they decide to leave for good. This is something that the people of most countries of Western Europe have not been able to do, except under tight controls for many years. The communist principle that all property really belongs to the government and can be used by favored citizens who have possession of that property only by sufferance of the government is also being advanced by many pro-communist regimes. But the insiders still face quite a storm when they try to establish that principle here. And they will face a real test when they try to impose on the American people that aspect of slavery which prohibits free movement either within or outside of our country. But suppose the insiders, using their present governmental power, start closing in tomorrow to make this a communist nation almost overnight. They wouldn't dare, nor even to start moving too fast in that direction. They could start an awakening and a reaction that would blow the whole conspiracy off the map, and they know it. The United States has no guarantee from God that it will escape the communist slavery that has already been imposed on so much of the world and now so imminently threatens the remainder. But this enslavement still presents a very massive problem to the conspirators. In the meantime, we still put complete confidence 
in what Joseph de Mestre said in 1811, quote, if the people understood the revolution today, it would end tomorrow, unquote. We know that it is identically the same revolution which we now face. And we know that for the first time in all those 160 years since the mess spoke, there is a sizable organization of courageous and honorable men and women dedicated to creating that understanding for which he prayed. This may yet prove to be the most important fact in the history of these crucial years. Well, that is a gallant position and a beautiful hope. But what are the obstacles faced by the conspiracy that will give you time to create this necessary understanding? May we enumerate a few of the most important? Please do. First, our system of freedom still has tremendous momentum. It has to be slowed down gradually instead of stopped short at anything approaching its present force, as the insiders are well aware. Second, our system of communication in the United States is almost infinitely more extensive and more varied than that in any country the communists have taken over. It would still be extremely difficult for them to seize and control all channels from ham radio operators to basement pamphlet printers in one fell swoop, or even a large enough percentage of all channels to keep the American people isolated from the truth. Third, the Russia of 1917 or the China of 1950 simply did not have the trappings or the customs of an industrial and commercial country. So the communists could start their socialistic methods on practically a clean slate. Even in Czechoslovakia of 1948 or Cuba of 1959, the economic system did not have anywhere near the ubiquitous reach into every aspect of people's lives that ours has today. Our still incredibly efficient production and distribution system is quite hard for even bureaucratic socialism to ruin altogether. The communists must tear down and wipe out tremendous institutions, traditions, forms, methods and customs in replacing them with socialism, which they are already trying to do, but it is no simple job. To do it here without stirring up more effective resistance than they have faced anywhere else will take considerable time. Fourth, our people are still armed. To the best of our knowledge, the communists have never yet taken over any country where so large a percentage of individuals and families possessed firearms, as is true in America today. And the present tricky and persistent moves by the insiders, first to register and then to confiscate all privately owned guns, have a long way to go before being successful enough for communist purposes. Fifth, there is no outside force tremendously more powerful than ourselves to help to impose communism on us as we did on Cuba and China and Poland. Of this, the insiders are well aware. So they are trying to supply that need by the threat of Soviet military might. There is plenty of treason at work in reducing our military strength and in helping the Soviets to build up their own so as to give some substance to their forthcoming claim of vast military superiority, and it should be stopped. But the attack is still psychological. The plan behind all of this propaganda is to enable traitors in our government to make many moves of gradual surrender to communist demands on the excuse that we are in no position to resist. There are internal reasons why the Soviets still could not conquer tiny Finland by force without having traitors inside the Finnish government to help them. Our danger is not from the armed might of Moscow, but from the treason of Washington. And the one thing that neither treason nor conspiracy can withstand is exposure 
and understanding on the part of its intended victims. Finally, without trying to make this list anywhere near complete, there is still far more patriotism left in America, with far more decency and self-respect and basic good character among the American people than the communists can afford to ignore. They are doing their utmost to destroy these characteristics by every foul means conceivable. But it all takes time, and the whole vast program for enslaving the American people can be stopped if we will have the courage to face the facts and to make enough others face them. They are encouraging points. But isn't political action the only means of stopping the communists from further tightening their lines of power like a straitjacket around the American people? Not at all. Even the communists do not yet dare to flout a sufficiently informed and determined public opinion. Just consider the case of J. Edgar Hoover, for example. There is no slightest doubt that all the insiders in Washington are determined to get rid of him at the earliest practicable moment. But even with his advanced age to support their arguments, they do not dare push him out in the face of so much public opinion to the contrary. Also, please do not underrate the potential effect of our educational program on political action. We believe that truth is the most powerful weapon in the world, provided, as George Washington said, somebody will take enough trouble to bring it to light. And that is the very purpose of our existence. So please consider what a thousand virtues in every congressional district could accomplish through the understanding and leadership they could provide without the society itself ever taking any part in politics or even supporting any of its own members who run for office. Do you know who got the largest vote of any candidate for Congress in the United States in the 1970 elections? It was a long-time ardent and outspoken virtue running openly and basically on Birch principles, the Honorable John G. Schmitz of the 35th District of California. The people of his district were sufficiently informed as to what was at stake. And it is no coincidence, of course, that this is a part of the very area of the United States where we have been strongest. Mr. Welch, one final question. Why have not the communists assassinated you? Give them time. So far, they have evidently believed either that they could destroy the John Birch Society, and goodness knows they have tried, or that I would cause them more damage and danger as a martyr than I could while still alive. And that is the only single attitude of the communists with which I have ever been in agreement. They do not want to make me a martyr, and I don't want to become one. What we want now is to move fast enough to have the society reach a level of influence that can slow down the communists, stop them, and finally rout them altogether. And July 4, 1971, just five years before the 200th anniversary of our country's independence, or before its formal absorption into a one-world communist empire, as the case might otherwise be, seemed an excellent time for us to give you this kind of an interview and to end that interview by quoting once again from Wordsworth. The land we from our fathers had in trust and to our children will transmit or die. This is our maxim, this our piety. Thank you, Mr. Welch. And I thank you for listening.